here. I want to give you an update on the drip irrigation. It has been so nice. We filled a five gallon bucket with water and let it go. And it has been a lifesaver. It has been over a hundred degrees here for the last two weeks. We have yesterday and today has been a little cooler and we're fixing the hundreds for the next 10 days. Yeah, okay. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Farm to Table Direct Show with your host, myself, Ryan, my brother Keith, off to my right. And today we have an exciting episode lined up for you as we dive into the world of sustainable living and homesteading. We are thrilled to introduce our special guest, guest Lorraine Sheha. Chia. 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 From Bluff Creek Acres, Lorraine, along with her husband Chris, made the brave move from Nebraska to Oklahoma, where they now live off grid on a sprawling 40 acre homestead. Their journey is truly inspiring, especially considering their first winter in Oklahoma was spent in a travel trailer amidst very brutal conditions. Lorraine will also be a featured speaker at the upcoming Oklahoma Homestead Rendezvous on September 27th and 28th, uh, where she will share her expertise on rainwater catchment, a crucial topic for anyone interested in sustainable water management. So be sure to join in, folks, on our live chat. Hit that like button, ring the bell, and share this so we can get the word out. Lorraine, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so we're going to just get started here. Uh, can you share with us just a little bit of about your journey from Nebraska to Oklahoma before you decided to pursue homesteading? Kind of tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, we moved to Nebraska from Texas, which is where we're originally from, and because of a job for Chris, my husband. And then... Uh, Lived in a little small town in Nebraska, grew a garden in the backyard, started learning to can, doing some of those little things that we now think of as just everyday normal life. And uh, then you got a job offer in Oklahoma. And we had looked at some properties in Nebraska, but decided that that just wasn't where we were supposed to be. So we moved to Oklahoma, uh, rented a, a house for a little while, then bought our RV and started our look for a homestead property in Oklahoma. It's centrally located for us. We have family, kids and grandkids in Nebraska, and we have family in Texas. So it kind of put us in the middle. We could get wherever we wanted to go in about the same amount of time. And uh, so that's why we ended up in Oklahoma. Well, listen, so what inspired you to make that dramatic shift <laughs> <laughs> from a small town lifestyle to off-grid living altogether? Um, it was a little bit of a process. It wasn't like an overnight decision. It uh, We wanted to be self-reliant for the, for the most part. I mean, you can never be totally reliant on yourself, but as much as we could. And also we wanted peace and quiet. We lived in a small town where the train came through all night long. <laughs> we know and about the train. We, we, have, <laughs> we have always lived next to a train somehow or another in, in, in our moves. And uh, we just wanted a little peace and quiet. We can sit in our yard and we can hear the birds. We can hear the chickens. We can hear the neighbor's dogs, but that's okay because they're, you know, 40 acres away. <laughs> so we just wanted that kind of peace and quiet and that self-reliance. So um, did you, were you already dreaming about a homestead while you were still in Nebraska? Was this something that was on the radar for you? It was you? kind of on the radar. It's where it kind of began. Like we were kind of like, you know, we could do this. We started thinking about it, talking about it, doing some research, but it wasn't um, like, a, oh, we have to do this right now thing. We really kind of took our time and decided that Nebraska was not where we wanted. It's for several reasons. It's got a smaller growing season. Uh, you can't grow okra very well in Nebraska. So, you know, priorities. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Pride okra. Pride right okra. <laughs> so, Love it. <laughs> yeah. So it was just kind of a very gradual thing in Nebraska. But upon knowing we were moving to Oklahoma, and one of the other reasons that we looked at Oklahoma was because of the land available here, the pricing on land, and the growing season. And, and those kinds of things that we would want to do as a homestead. Yeah. When you talk about the move to Oklahoma, I mean, one, living in a travel trailer, <laughs> yes. still living in a travel still trailer. Still living in a travel trailer. Right. And, and having done that for even just a few months, I, I recognize that challenge. Yes. Um, and uh, so I know there was challenges when you were hunting for the land and you were trying to find that place. What kept you motivated? Wanting that peace and quiet and that reliance, just right. knowing that this is where, knowing that this is Oklahoma is where we were supposed to have our homestead and just moving towards that every day. And in our travel trailer, we lived in an RV park on a highway. 
So <laughs> that'll, dri- that'll drive you to leave. Every day you hear that, that traffic all day, every day, all day long. And you're like, I can't stay here much longer. So it was a very motivating to, to be able to just have our own space. So when you first found the uh, 40 acres, kind of like, what was your feeling when you said, oh, this is it? That this was, is that that was piece it. Land, In right? fact, I, my first video is about uh, walking our property for the first time. You couldn't drive in. You had to walk in and, uh, we both just knew immediately, like, this is it. This is our spot. This is our final home. This is where we're going to fulfill all the dreams we have for our homestead and our life. So what was your first steps? Uh, first steps. Wow. Uh, well, there was no access in. So first step was to clear a spot for Chris to camp while he was clearing a driveway. Right. <laughs> so he would spend weekends down there and all his free time down there doing all of that. And so getting the driveway in, and then we had to get our solar set up. We had to get our RV cover in. We brought in a storage container to store our stuff in. And then once that was all in, we started the rainwater system, but we couldn't complete it until the trailer was moved in because the way it sets up, you had to move the trailer in and then we could complete the system. So those were the first things was getting our solar, our rainwater, our RV cover and access. That was the priority. The first few things we had to do. So, I mean, I'm kind of going to move into that winter challenge, but how much of a timeline did you have from the time you dropped that trailer and all that stuff in there before winter was coming? Well, it was a couple of months. So we moved in our trailer in in September okay. of 2020. Right. And uh, so then we had just a couple of months before it got cold. Right. <laughs> well, you know, that's what we're talking about. You know, that you, you talked about that first one being really harsh mm-hmm. and, and, and which I, I find funny because y'all moved from, your, <laughs> from upper Nebraska. I yes. know where y'all moved from. I've yes. been there yes. and I know what Nebraska winter is. Yes. yes. So it came south with you. It came with us that year. <laughs> yes, it did. I told Chris a couple of times we, we left Nebraska. I feel like I'm back in Nebraska. <laughs> right. I mean, so, you know, for the watchers, um, <laughs> Why don't you kind of explain a little bit about that first winter and what exactly happened? So that first winter was the winter here that we had like 14 days of snow on the ground, below freezing weather, negative degrees at night, and we live in an RV. And it's cold. I mean, yeah. RVs are not insulated. They're not made for living in full time. Right. So, And we also have to consider our power consumption because it's cloudy and it's gray and we're not getting as much solar power as we would like. So we're using a generator to run our house. So we have heat. Um, You're wearing two pairs of socks and a pair of house shoes and a jacket and whatever. And then because we know where we want to put our house, we've placed our garden and our animals and those kinds of things adjacent to where we would be comfortable from our house. So Mm -hmm. from our trailer where we're living now to where the animals are is quite a distance so then it's trekking through the snow down to take care of the animals and all that two or three times a day, make sure their waters aren't frozen. Uh, just, it was crazy, but we also had to worry about, you know, our water freezing. Right. This is the first winter with the rain catchment and our ball valve on our tank froze. was inspect, <laughs> was insulated, but we added more insulation we were checking it constantly. We were actually using a blow dryer to blow warm air in there just to make sure that we weren't going to lose because if that ball valve goes we lose all our water right so So, of course i have to ask you did you feel like giving up did you did you look at it and say um i think maybe uh i might have made a mistake here uh, or we had a little bitty generator that you had to you know yank on really hard to get it started yeah i did not like that thing it didn't like me. That was my biggest frustration for the winter. I would actually yank on it and go flying because I would yank on it too hard and couldn't hold it down with one hand. It was just an, an experience. But other than those kinds of little frustrations, no, I never thought, oh, no, we made a mistake or, oh, I can't do this. Now, looking back, it's like, oh, well, we did that. So anything anything else is going to be at least <laughs> right. We know we can get through that. So right, it's trial by fire, but this yes. in this case, trial by snow. Probably. Trial by snow. Yes. And I did not own a pair of car hearts at the time, but oh. I do now. Right. <laughs> because if it ever happens again, I will be nice and well, toasty when he, warm. Yeah. When, I, when he first, uh, you know, we were first talking about everything and, you know, and mentioned the winter, I was like, you know, of course, I didn't know exactly where y'all were located. And, and I'm like, man, I know it gets that way on the north side of Tulsa, up there on the Kansas border. But, mm-hmm. as I, you know, down south, you don't usually get pretty rough. No, normally it doesn't. But, but uh, the, 
that year. year. And, you know, I, you talk about things preparing. Uh, I was an over-the-road trucker for a lot of years, and my wife went with me for a part of a summer, and we learned how to live in a sleeper <laughs> on a truck and not kill each other for two or three weeks. Mm-hmm. And so then when we moved into the travel trailer, for the and winter was coming and zero degrees was coming. Uh, so I had to go out and unhook the water and make sure the pipes didn't freeze. But I was like, this is 33 foot long travel trailer. This is nothing compared to that semi trailer. Right. We got a bathroom. We can go to several, <laughs> yeah, we, we can leave. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can get a little bit of distance between right. yourselves. Yeah. But uh, you know, so, but yeah, that is that challenge. And I mean, it's so, I mean, the resilience, the, mm-hmm. the you know, from from learning that, I mean, I mean, is that I mean, you kind of alluded to it that it carries you through so much of that, right? You know? Yeah, yeah. So we just learned that we can, if we could get through that winter and all that cold weather. I was also wearing a boot on my ankle because the day before it snowed, I tripped and twisted my ankle really bad. So in the snowstorm, Chris is taking me to the doctor because we're not sure it's not broken the next morning when right. it's all swollen. So you know, just one thing after the other, after the other, after the other. So if you get used to that, you can know that right. you can get through that. Then. Well, so I guess I guess the lesson to our listeners, or lesson to anybody that's going to watch this later, is is you know, you know, don't let the knocks catch you. Just kind of keep keep hitting it, keep going after it. There's and, always a light at the end of the tunnel, and right. you know it's short term. Winter only lasts so long. Summer right. heat only lasts so long. Right. You look forward to that spring and that fall right. when you can really just enjoy it all, <laughs> and then know that the rest is going to be short term as well. So I take from that that your why has to be greater than the challenges before you. Yes, when you definitely, so. definitely. You, you really know that that's, this is where you're supposed to be. This is what you're supposed to be doing. And this is what you want to be doing. You can do it. It, it definitely. So a step-by-step approach. Now, when, when we were talking earlier, you, had, you said that it was your policy that you're going to take one step at a time, and you're going to finish that step before you ever go to the next one. Mm-hmm. Why was that so important to you guys? Well, we learned from a lot of other homesteaders that you can get overwhelmed if you try to do too much too fast. And I heard one of them say, be the master of one. So make one thing doable and then add the next thing. So even if it's just learning how to raise chickens, getting your coop set up, your building set up, whatever you're doing, and get that system running, then add another one. Because if you jump in and you try to do chickens and goats and horses and cows and everything else, you're going to get overwhelmed and you're going to get burned out. And you're going to probably walk away because it's not an easy lifestyle. We love it, but it's not easy. And so when you pile it all on at one time, then you really overwhelm yourself. So if by doing it also one step at a time, you do it better. Mm-hmm. You you put your infrastructure in and it's better built. You right. know it's working. You're taking your time. You're making it right so you don't have to come back and fix it later. So apparently there are people out there who just have this idea that they they want chickens, they want goats, they want cows, and they go out and they buy all of this stuff before they ever build the infrastructure. Mm-hmm. So that would be, I think, pretty important to you guys. Why are you right? throwing rocks at me? <laughs> hey man, I didn't say your name. I was trying to protect you here. <laughs> yeah. Yes, but yes, you just don't over want to overwhelm yourself, and then then you are with all these animals, and you don't know how to take care of them, and you don't have the infrastructure. And baby steps, right. baby steps always work better. Yeah, I'll share what we're talking about. I, I wasn't even living on the property yet. My son-in-law and daughter were up there, and we had a pen built for our dogs that were up there because. We had two, and we had to keep them put up because they tore everything up they could get a hold of. And he came across an opportunity to get a goat. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'll go in half with you. Yeah. No idea. Just no idea. Him. Got a pen. Hey, listen, they'll go in there. Just put them in there. <laughs> Didn't know that goats are a social creature. If you have one by himself, he is going to leave. He is very and, unhappy, and, yes. And, and very scared and very unhappy. And two dogs that were not happy about it either. <laughs> and so I said, either somebody got a free goat. Or somebody got a free dinner. One of the two happened, but there was a hundred and fifty dollar <laughs> lesson, uh, yes. you know, on right. goat because we didn't have things ready. Right. And so that was my thing. After that, I was like, okay, no more animals, no more nothing, until I'm up there, and we got things where we can have them. Right. And so it was that lesson learned the hard way. Right. And the other thing is, when you're starting a homestead, and you're especially if you're on new land, you don't always know how your land is going to react, like in rain, those right. kind of things. So you don't want to go in and drop a bunch of infrastructure or a bunch of animals. And then all of a sudden you're in a situation where you have your chickens that are, you know, in two feet of water because you got to 
Goldie Washer rain and you didn't right. realize that that's rain. So that's another reason to take your time is to learn your land right. and the layout of your land and how it reacts to different yeah. weather situations. I'm getting confirmation on all kinds of things because <laughs> we've well, had that property for five years. And for five years, I could drive anywhere on that property I wanted to drive. It was solid. This last year, we had so much rain mm-hmm. that I was getting stuck in places that I had never had water. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> you just, you have to learn the lay of your land. Right. So, right. Okay. Man. So, um, you or me? <laughs> I think it's. I think, I think it's, it's mine, mine, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, sorry to lose track. That's no, what we it's do. Okay. Um, so, what's some have been some of the most rewarding projects so right. far? Let me kind of restate that. The one that probably eased your mind the most, if you will, like you know, which one said, you know, we finally got this part done, and it's made our life a little bit easier to deal with? Um, the garden. I would say for me, the garden gave me the biggest sense of an accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Although we continue to build on it, that first garden, because then I knew we had, we have raised garden beds, so I knew we could grow our food. I knew that it was protected from the deer and the other animals, and that if nothing else, we always had some kind of food, a space to grow food. And I love our garden. It's also one of our favorite things to do together, to go down and garden. And it's a relaxing thing for us. Mm -hmm. So it's a place where we can go and just kind of zone out and do our thing and enjoy it. So that is our big, for me, that is the biggest. That's the biggest one. That's the biggest one. Right. And ladies and gentlemen, um, we are here with Lorraine Chiak, and we're going to be talking about rainwater catchment systems here in just a minute. Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to get a little word from our sponsor. All right, Farm to Table Direct Coffee. Are you ready for the freshest cup of coffee you've ever tasted? Welcome to Farm to Table Direct Coffee, your destination for specialty coffee roasted to perfection. At Farm to Table Direct Coffee, we offer a wide variety of premium coffee beans. And unlike the commodity coffee that is on the shelves at most stores, our beans are hand-picked for ripeness. And it's available in several packaging options to suit your needs. Different size ounces, beans ground or not ground, all that good stuff. All right. The process is simple. Place your order and our expert roasters get to work. Your coffee is roasted and shipped the very same day, ensuring peak freshness and flavor. You can't get it any fresher, folks. And I'll tell you, it couldn't be easier from placing the order to receiving notifications throughout the process. Farm to Table Direct Coffee will keep you informed of every step of the way. And for the freshest custom roasted coffee, visit our store, farmtotabledirectcoffee.com. That is the farm, not the farm, the number two table direct coffee. Dot com. Yeah, it's new, guys. So, uh, you know, yeah. <laughs> you'd think I've said the farm to table, and I'm so used to putting the in front of it, the farm to table direct coffee. Yeah, let me but, say, did you say farm the number two table farm direct to coffee coffee dot com? That's what I said. <laughs> farm to table direct, farm number two table direct coffee dot com. And experience the difference that farm to table direct coffee can make in your morning routine. Farm to table direct coffee. From the farm to your table, the freshest coffee guaranteed. Okay, so now we're going to get into uh, the water catchment systems, Lorraine. And uh, let's, let's just talk a little bit about that. Why did you prioritize this project on your homestead? I mean, I think the, the answer is pretty obvious, but I, I just want to hear it from you. At what, at what point did you guys do that part? So it was a process, just like deciding to go off grid. Um, but for us, there were a couple parts of it. The, when we bought our property, we knew that whatever property we bought, we would do a well or water or rainwater catchment. Um, because Chris actually has reactions to the water here in Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. He actually has an allergic reaction to the water. That is bizarre. Interesting. Yes, it's an unusual <laughs> thing, but it does happen. I, he, he's over in the background. I had to look over and I'm like, <laughs> really? <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, even before we moved into our RV at our rental home, we were filtering water for him to cook with and stuff. But we knew we would do a well or rainwater. And then once we purchased our property, then it was just a matter of deciding which way we wanted to go. Uh, Logically, it just worked better for us to do rainwater. Financially, it was much better to do rainwater. We could do a system for a lot less than a well. And then we also had to consider that we, since we had gone solar, we would have to have another whole system set up 
to run a pump right. on the well. So rainwater was just really kind of logical for us. It was one of, we knew it would be one or the other, but in our situation on this property, that's the one that was the most logical. I'm going to take a little break right in here, bro. I know we just did the little commercial break, but sure. uh, we've had some people coming in on the chat over here. Okay. And uh, uh, of course, Chris from the rendezvous said, Hey, <laughs> and, uh, uh, Chris Tyler said, Natalie's scared to hi- say hi, so hey. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, Linda Saunders said, hi, Layla, Lala? Lala. Lala. That's my sister. Okay. Everybody calls me Lala. Okay. And uh, somebody, uh, Nama, Nama, said, hi, Mom. Hi, Mom. Oh, that's my daughter, Natalie. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Nama. Hello, and Nama. Uh, Cheyenne said hi, Auntie. Yep. So, yep. all right. So you're all in there. They're all in uh, there. That, that's right. that's good. Glad y'all are joining us. Glad you're here with us. Just want to take a minute to acknowledge the text. And hey, if you got any questions or, you know, if you're making plans to visit, you know, you can <laughs> throw it up there so they'll know you're coming. But, My sister will actually be here tomorrow. <laughs> oh, awesome. Well, hey, safe travels. Yeah, so, she'll yeah. Be here tomorrow. Okay. Nice. Well, um, you know, you talked about that, that priority. I mean, of, of course, I've told, you know, Keith and, and a lot of our conversations, you know, number one is water. Always. I mean, always. If you always. don't have water. You uh, have hey, hey, Jack and Dana. Nice to see you there. Um, anyway, it, uh, uh, yeah, so you always got to have water. If you don't have water, you have nothing. Right. Uh, water is life. Yes. And, um, but how has it impacted your daily life? I mean, you know. It is definitely a big change of mindset when you right. do rainwater catchment because you have to catch figure out everything you can do to conserve water. Conservation is your main goal because we have a 2,100 gallon tank. If that runs dry, I don't have any water. I can't call the city and say, Hey, (laughs) come turn my water back on or what's happening. Uh, But uh, so, you know, we use a composting toilet, which saves water. We don't have a dishwasher. We take very short showers. Uh, Yes. (laughs) Uh, Military showers for him, but even really short showers. And then, you know, our daily life is affected in that, you know, today I can do laundry at home because we're going to have a rain where we've just had rain and we have enough water. But three weeks from now, I might have to go to the laundry mat to do water because we're at the point where we have to think about saving water. Right. And even through the drought last year, you know, we had to con- really conserve water and make sure we weren't overusing it. So every day it impacts how how you decide to do certain things that you would normally not ever think about. You know, you always just think, Oh, I can throw my clothes in laundry and, you know, hang them on the line and be good. And not have to think about how much water is right. that going to use. Right. Well, you said that you couldn't call the city. <laughs> That's an now, interesting. I knew now, where he was going now. <laughs> let, let me say this. <laughs> this is funny. She can't call the city, but she works, works for, for the city, city water, water department. department. I do work for a rural water department. I don't really work for a city department, but I do work for a rural water department, which I didn't work for them. When we moved on to our property, I I took the job afterwards. But it's been an eye-opener, even for somebody who does rainwater catchment. I've learned a lot about conserving water and how much water people actually use on a daily basis. Um, We've calculated out that we use about 400 gallons of water a month for the two of us. I have customers who use eight and 9,000 gallons of water I every saying, month. I'm, I'm wow, a 3,000 gallon guy. I'm telling you. But I, when we I, lived I in see a, my bill every month. <laughs> right. But when we lived in town and we used water in Nebraska, I never looked at my bill even to know how much water, like it was not anything I ever thought about, you know, or even now people call and say, you know, why did my bill so high? You know, well, the first thing I ask them is, do you have a toilet that's <laughs> running? Because yeah, for you, sure. I never knew how much water one of those could that use. Drip, drip, drip matters. It adds up fast. I mean, so that's why I working watch, for the water department has been really eye opening. in that's a lot why of ways. I watch. Well, now I've got to ask you. I've been dying to ask this okay. question to you. <laughs> here we go. Come here, just a minute. Okay. Does the water company know that you don't buy water from them? Uh, yes, they know that I'm on rainwater and I don't even work for the one close to where I live. And uh, oh, so okay. it's not even local to where I live. No skin off their back. No, but um, <laughs> but they do all know that I that we live off rainwater. So it's a conversation that comes up every once in a while when the weather okay, gets we've got we got a question from Jack Dyer okay. from okay. Dyer Family Farms. He says, <laughs> do you have to get a permit for rainwater catchment in Oklahoma? No. There you go, Jack. No, you do now not. Now you know. 
You do not. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's You're hanging out in the right place. If you guys have got questions. <laughs> got questions, right. I'm going to yes, ask it right now. Yes. Hey, hey, if you want to understand that fancy math that they come up with your water bill, because I promise you <laughs> it's, some, it's some scientific calculations that comes up with that right. millage. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was voodoo magic. <laughs> it's voodoo magic. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Because <laughs> it's like, I'll be up, but you talked about the leaks and talked about, you know, like I said, a, a, a toilet running or, right. or a shower yeah. dripping. Or, yes. You know, and. Uh, because I'm on a rural water. I have wells on the property, but I'm on a rural water thing. And that was the thing was what got me in the habit of looking at that usage mm-hmm. every month and what money is because we had had leaks mm-hmm. and we had, and you mm-hmm. know, there's bills jumping through the roof and it made no sense. Why all of a sudden, you right. know, and I can't find a leak anywhere on the ground. There was a toilet running yep. and I didn't know it. It was in a back bathroom mm-hmm. and toilet was running yep. and got that shut off and, bill dropped up right yeah they Which, can they can use ten thousand gallons of water in a month yeah and right it's crazy. so i would think that that being off the grid and depending on rainwater catchment that you really got to be mindful about those little things yes a lot yes she eliminated the water to the toilet so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes well but we did but even like um running a faucet too long when you're brushing your teeth mm-hmm. or when you're doing dishes you know, when I go to rinse dishes, I rinse the dish and I turn the water off. Right. And then I pick up the next dish and rinse it and shut the water off because normally you would just leave the water running because you don't think about that. But right. cutting that water on and off, whether you're, you know, or when you wash your hands. You, I mean, a lot of us, when we were kids, our parents would tell us, turn the water off while you're brushing your teeth. Turn the right. water off while you're washing your <laughs> hands. There was a reason for that. And right. it adds up very quickly. Right. Very well, quickly. So, so we grew up in a house with, with six people. Mm-hmm. So it was two adults, four kids. And yeah, it was like, you didn't go in there and take no hour long shower. No. I promise. It was no. not happening. No. <laughs> not without getting yelled at. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But uh, plus, it was the only bathroom. So everybody wanted you out anyway. <laughs> yes. uh, but no, the uh, how much that impact. I mean, so I'm going to ask, I mean, because I know you live in a travel trailer, and, I, cause I have, and I, since I have one, I know they have a pump yes. that'll pull water. Yes. Is that what you use to get the water? Through the travel trailer? Yes, okay. we have to because our trailer sits above the ground, so okay. you have to pull the water up. When we build our house, it will be gravity fed. Okay, all right. See, because that was my question: was like, how do you get it from the tank to the sink? Right, you know? it comes just through the regular pump, just like um, we've plumbed it in, but it would be just like a regular RV pump. Okay, and it just pumps it now, up into the house. You mentioned the gravity feed later when yes. the house is built. Now, is that going to be on the side of the house and it's going to run through a pipe in the attic and drop down? Or Well, the water, where our water tank is now, right. is one of the higher points of okay. our property. So and our go. house will be much lower. Okay, So, so it'll just gravity. grab your feed okay. into there. Okay. So you will use, right now, I, I believe if, uh, I remember what you said earlier, that, that right now you have different systems on the property. Mm-hmm. One is the uh, cover for your travel trailer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, roof system there is collecting and that one is for human consumption. Yes. But it's not just human consumption. No. What else? Uh, we do use some of that water for watering like our cats and dogs, animals up closer to the house. Mm-hmm. Right. But then we have two chicken runs and two chicken coops and we collect rain off of a small uh, roof that's between those two where we keep our rabbits right. and that water we use to water all of our animals our rabbits our chickens so the water's right there it's a big tank with hose and we can just yeah. fill all the waters okay and then we have a big ibc tote in our garden because we use a drip system in our garden it sits at the highest point of our garden because our whole property pretty much slopes and then we do pump water into that to water our garden. So you're, you're pumping that one out of the main into uh, the IBC tote? Well, I, we or... pump the water out of our creek and pump it into the IBC oh, tote. Oh, so creek. you've got a creek that's a involved creek. with this yes. one. Oh, so do you right. have any plans to increase your surface area? We will. We'll be building a canning shed that we'll collect rain off, off of, as mm-hmm. well as any anything that we can build and put a barrel on it. We have a, uh, an outdoor shower uh, outhouse combination mm-hmm. and it will have room water catchment as well. So, so what would be, let's say for you guys and, and knowing that you've got a garden, you've got animals um, and you're trying to take care of them with water catchment systems, what would be like that, that perfect amount of rain to catch so that it made your life a lot easier? Wow. 
I don't know. Depends on the surface you're working off of. Like sure. for our house, you know, the first rain we had was three inches and we got our tank over halfway full because it gave us, a, we get almost 500 gallons off of our RV cover. Uh, so for the year, I don't know. That's a good question. The amount of rain we actually need for a whole year. I've never calculated well, like I mean, the full year. Well, I mean, you said 400 gallons a month, so I mean, that's right. 4,800 gallons a year. A year and we so. don't, we've not been below the 1,000 gallon, 800 gallon mark. It's probably the lowest we've so ever been. If you know, would it be safe to say if you doubled the 2,100 gallon tank <laughs> yes. and had enough surface to support that? Now, oh, we have enough surface already to support that. In the oh. spring, when it rains, we have water that runs off out of our overflow because we need a second tank. I'm going to, I'm probably getting in. I don't want to give too much away for things coming down the road, <laughs> but I mean, because right. like right now, I'm like, I know what happens to water when it sits in the tank. Yes. How do you get past that? I mean, um, yeah, and I'm away from the mic. He's always a <laughs> daggum director. Anyway. Yeah. No. <laughs> so we have a filter system that, where it comes into our house. Okay. And we will have a filter system in our home when we build a home because you will get sediment. We have a first flush okay. system that that is a system that set up that basically cleans your roof. Okay. So the first 55 gallons of, of water that comes off our roof goes into a separate little tank. And then it starts to fill our big tank. So that cleans all the dust, the pollen. Pollen's a big problem. Right. Um, all the extra little sticks and leaves and whatever into that first flush. And then it goes into the big tank. So that helps keep a lot of that out of your tank. Okay. So I'm assuming a metal roof is preferred over... A metal roof is definitely preferred. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yes. Right. Note to self. Because the shingle roof needs to leave. And, yes. I'll, <laughs> and I'll just say to everybody here is that uh, there you go. You know, it didn't even occur to me that you had to, you had to let a certain amount of rain wash your roof before you start collecting. Yes, you do. You know, and if you want to learn more about how that works, uh, of course, we're we're hoping that everybody will come out and uh, support us at the Oklahoma Homestead Rendezvous because uh, Lorraine will be there as one of the speakers and yes. speaking on this particular topic. Yes. Yep. And uh, Lorraine. Um, is there, and, and guys, I want to say, if there's any questions right now that you want to ask Lorraine, <laughs> this is the time to do right. it. Yeah, as I was saying now, Jack did ask, he said he missed it, which you referenced how big your tank was, but you said 2,100 gallons. It's a 2,100 gallon 2100 tank. 2,100 gallon. And Kyle said, hi, Lala, this is Kyle. So, <laughs> hi, Kyle. Uh, um, oh, he's, Jack is on it. How do you keep a tank clean from algae? Uh, you want a, a black tank? Okay. So you don't want a clear tank because the light is what will actually create the algae. Okay. Notes. Right. right. And I was wondering that because I think we had that little bit of the conversation about they were black. And uh, and I noticed also that your IBC tank was black. Yes. We have one IBC tote that we painted black as a test to see how it would work. Uh, we prefer to just wrap them in plastic. good heavy plastic, okay. black plastic. Because light is what will create your algae. And if it's there's no light getting to it, you won't get algae in it. Well, now, I've heard something about um, about algae. Mold is okay, is not okay, but algae is okay. What do you have to say about that? And, and, and we talked about a gentleman a little bit earlier, and he's the one that said it to me. He said, I'm, I don't mind drinking algae, water that has algae, but... Not that kind. What do you have to say to that individual? For me, I would say that's a personal decision. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would drink water with algae. I mean, I'm not saying I wouldn't. Right. Um, it is a naturally occurring thing, mm -hmm. and mold is too. But sure. yes, mold would definitely be, I would say, uh, more detrimental. I would not drink water with mold. Algae would be questionable, just for me on a personal level. Um, I It wouldn't hurt animals, though, so... You could yeah. definitely use it for your animals. Well, let's just say, I mean, I know I'm, you know, I, I work in the poultry industry and we use uh, what we have water tanks for everything. Mm -hmm. And we even have water that sprays water onto the chickens and such. And yeah, those tanks on the inside, oh, there's green algae. Mm -hmm. They're every, it's everywhere in there. And it's like, you know, we're all going to die. <laughs> you know? This water's going to kill us one day, you know. But, I don't um, think the algae will kill you, no. but I don't know that it may not. Well, it may not taste good. It just don't, it, well, we don't try not to drink it, but it just yeah. it's it, it's like I used to. It's not as bad now, but I used to on my glasses. The the old systems we had, I, if I, I couldn't wear my glasses out there because it'd be covered in film from the oils and stuff in that tank. But 
Um, so yeah, it that does matter. Um, you know, and so that's a good question, Jack. I mean, as far as keeping those clean, yeah, um, yeah, Jack. And so you know. Man, I don't want to give too much away. We can say, I can have this conversation. I know. <laughs> I'm like absorbing knowledge here right. by the second. Well, you'll just have to come to the presentation. Well, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll have to make sure we make a point to that one. Yep. Um, Chris, by the way, from Oklahoma Head and Stead Rendezvous, is super excited for Lorraine to be there. Awesome. Um, so, you know, super Thank you. excited. Yeah. So, and I'll tell you, after, uh, you know, I, to me, it's like, oh, I, it's, there's so much more to it. Yes, there's a lot to it. Because I thought it was put a tank out there and catch the water. <laughs> nope. You know, um, now I have seen the where people have them, where they have the like the 55 gallon blue drums and mm-hmm. it goes through the different mm-hmm. filters. I mean, mm-hmm. is that something y'all use? Or? We don't, but it is an option. Okay. Yep, it is an option, in a, a different way to filter your water. There's, okay. you can do it that way. Okay. So, are you filtering for your animals? At no, all? no need for that. Yeah. Okay, they got their own filter. Yeah, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, you think about it, animals. They, I mean, my chickens, they go out and drink whatever water's in the ground. I know my, and I know so, my, dog, my yeah. dog will walk right past a bowl of cold, clean water <laughs> yes. to the dirty pot of water. Yes, yes. <laughs> Animals are fine with it, so they, do, they don't care, so they'll drink right. it. Right. And so how long did you, I know I know that you watched Off Grid with Doug and Stacy, and yes. you learned a lot from yes, them they, about their water yes. catchment system. Yes. And how much information did you absorb before you guys jumped into it? A lot, a lot. Um, Doug and Stacy's system is very much similar to what we've set up uh-huh. for the most part. So it was very informational for us, the whole filter system that they use. I mean, we would talk about it and he, a question would come up and I'd say, I don't know, let me go watch Doug's <laughs> video. And right. we'd go back and reference it, just trying to make sure we had all our bases covered right. um, and all the things that we needed in place. And then there's there's several other references that we've used in other YouTube channels, but that was a very big help for us. Yes. Right. And so um, what would you tell people about the sheer amount of knowledge that, um, or how much listening to other people should they do before they actually try to attack their So in other words, like Ryan said, I thought you just put something out there and caught the rain. (laughs) It's more than that. Yes. It's not hard though. It's, it's, it's pretty simple. Mm-hmm. But yes, you definitely want to do your research. And I would say there are books out there. Uh, there's a gentleman, uh, his name is I think Brad Lancaster. He has a couple of books and he gets into very extensive detail, like as far as like ponds and cisterns and all kinds of swells and all of that. But there's also a lot of good information just on basic rainwater and how water re- handles itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, do your research. It's not that difficult. I mean, we started with a five gallon bucket on our back porch. Right. There you go. There you go. It can yeah. be that simple. It start, really can. It really start can. small and grow up. And grow right? up. And, and, uh, and you guys are still growing. Yes. So yes. What, what would you say um, to the people who's considering to attend the Oklahoma Homestead Rendezvous? Mm-hmm. Um, what can they expect to hear from you whenever... Without giving yeah. away too much. Without giving it uh, everything <laughs> Without away. Without giving tonight. it all away. Which I don't think you can because there's a lot. There's to a lot. To you know, a lot of right. knowledge to it. Yeah. But, um, you know, we'll cover the whys. Why do you want to do it? Um, mm-hmm. The pros and cons. The change of mindset kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And um, the benefits. There are a lot of benefits to rainwater for a lot of different reasons, not just conservation or anything. And then um, just encouragement. I really want to encourage people to just think about it, even if it's just to water a garden or whatever your purpose right. may be. Uh, I don't want people to be scared. It's not, it looks kind of scary, but it's really not that scary. Are you going to give them like a list of different suppliers that they can We will have some references. Of this, yes. Some references this, to that. And some resources. Yes, right. definitely. Right. right. And so if you could shorten the distance between point A and point B for them, you know, point A being a starter to, you know, getting finished with it. Those would be the kind of things that yes. they can expect at the Oklahoma yes. yeah. Homestead. From beginning to right. being ready to get your set, system set up. Right. So, um, well, bro, yeah. what well, you got I, there? I guess, I mean, kind of. Any other questions? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, you're in the process. Like I said, you're still building. Right. You know what I mean? This has been a, it, and that's the thing, folks. It ain't overnight. I've, been, I've had my property for five years <laughs> and, and not overnight. still got. I, w- I will probably have work forever. Um, <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. <laughs> and that's okay, though. As I was supposed to say, there's not a day of the week I don't have something I could mm-hmm. be doing. Um, but what's probably been that f- most fulfilling part of that journey? I mean, Knowing that we could do it 
and doing it together. Right. Doing it together, I think, for us has been the biggest thing. Do you ever just sit around outside at the sunset and just think, look at this? <laughs> yes. Look we had that conversation on the way here. Is that uh, right? Chris and I did. Yeah. Because I will say, look what I've done. He's like, but we're not done. We're not done. And I'm like, but look at where we are. Like when you think that this was raw land and it had nothing but trees on it. Right. Like you, you couldn't, there was no way to even get a yeah. four wheeler in there, nothing. Right. And then now we have, you know, all this infrastructure and we have a beautiful garden and we have our animals and, and we're still growing. I mean, we'll be adding more animals and things, but sometimes when you're in the throes of it, it is hard to sit back and look at it and say, look what we've done. Cause you always know there's so much more you want to do. But you do need to take that time and mm-hmm. say, when we do, we sit on our little deck in front of our RV and say, oh, look, look what we've done together. And right. and doing it together for us is the biggest thing. We, we have fun with that. So obviously I've got to ask this question too. Do you miss the water bill? No. I don't miss the water bill and I don't miss the power well, bill. And <laughs> you, you don't have to be so quick about it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's funny because we laugh about this. We open our mailbox 99% of the time. There's nothing in it. <laughs> uh, well, right. that's, that's a good feeling. That's a good so feeling. Say, that's a, yeah. Other than uh, political ads or right. junk mail. But oh, right. yeah. yeah. Well, you know, well, listen, I'm, I'm, this wasn't on the list and I'm, I'm going to bring this up. I mean, just because kind of in, in conversation here, picking it up. And, and now I was raised never to ask a woman her age and I won't. No, that's okay. But uh, obviously, I can figure uh, that you were a grandmother when you started this. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, folks, age isn't the issue. No, it's not. Right. No. You no. Know, I mean, that's, I mean, because as a grandfather already, mm-hmm. uh, you know, my, 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 my wife's kids didn't, they grew up in town. So they didn't grow up rural. Me and Keith grew up on six acres. We grew up out in the country where you could run for days. I mean, right. you know, and now my grandkids are getting that. Mm-hmm. And, and for me, that was the biggest enjoyment of having the land. Plus, as you mentioned earlier about the quiet. Oh. I mean, yeah. I can, I, I always tell people that's, that's my geographical happy place. Yes. You know, yes. in the world. And so, I mean, I appreciate that you're sharing it. And I also appreciate that y'all are willing to just say, you know what, at this, at whatever juncture you are in life, you know, at that point in life saying, you know what, Let's do this. Yeah. We actually waited till our kids were out of, I mean, it just happened that way, but our kids were all out of the house when we, right. when we found our property and started our journey. Now our son did stay with us for the first nine months or so. And he was very instrumental in helping us get a lot of things done. Right. Um, I was but, smart yeah. enough to have one son and my daughter on the property. <laughs> there they're, you our, go. they're our retirement plan. When we yes. get old, uh-huh. they're going yep. to, yep. <laughs> they're, they're, yep. they're there. We have 40 acres and our family is welcome to move on anytime they want to. So uh, y'all heard that. Oh, wow. They, they heard. all know it. That would be my dream for all my kids to live and my parents oh, to live on amazing. my property. Yeah. Yes. Jack, Chris is in studio. He's just sitting off. <laughs> He's camera. sitting over there. He's sitting right. over there listening to all this. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, well, listen, you know, uh, Hey, thanks for joining us. I mean, that's it, my pleasure. I, I love mean, it. It's my head's growing. I could probably sit here and ask you questions for the rest of the night, but we can't do that. Um, right. You know, um, I don't have, I'm not seeing anything new up in the chat. I mean, so, I so, think, you know, well, how about in the studio? Well, in the studio. Yeah. Like, um, one of the things that, you know, a large part of our audience has homestead channels. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I just want to encourage those people that that are watching this, uh, that's, that has their own homestead channel. There is nothing like going to an event like oh, the man. Oklahoma Homestead Rendezvous right. and those types of things. Mm-hmm. So yeah. I just want to touch and, and, and highlight that just a little bit because I can tell you, we just went to our second one, yeah. right? Yeah. And Back this year, yeah. and um, I had no idea. Oh. I had no idea how many like-minded people uh, that was there, you know, because sometimes in this world, you know, you think you're the only mm-hmm. one, you know, especially if you're on a solo mission on YouTube, finding out all of these things that's going wrong in the world, or if you're finding out how to do something. You know, right. you might think that you're alone, but you're not. And if you go to these, you get to network with with an awful lot of people. And, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, um, you've done these events. You're a speaker and mm-hmm. more than that. And I think you've got some other speaking uh, uh, that's coming up after that. Am I am I wrong about that? I am doing the um, Urban Homestead at the State Fair. Right. 
which uh, Rachel and them had organized right. through right. the state fair. And there I'll actually be talking about canning because I also do right. share about canning. So I'll be doing a canning presentation over there. Okay. Yeah, I know I'd seen your name on the list. I just don't – I didn't remember the topic yep. of, of, of yeah. that. So. so I'll be doing canning over there and then rainwater catchment at the rendezvous. Right. So what would you say that people could expect um, about – showing up to these types of events. What, what's it like for you? I know what it's like for us. Well, I've attended a few. Uh, I did Doug and Stacy's. We uh, attended one of their homesteading mm -hmm. expos too. Uh, I find that you learn a lot. You get to ask the questions that are particular to you. So mm -hmm. if you're wanting to learn how to can, you can ask a very specific question and get a, an answer pretty quickly rather than trying to put it on a feed in a YouTube channel right. or on a chat or Instagram or whatever. So it's very personal. And you also get to meet a ton of great people who are walking the same walk you are. And their story might be a little different, but you're on the same path. And right. you can make those connections and that's the one thing about homesteaders is we love community mm -hmm. and we love to build community. And so you get the opportunity to meet and community does not mean your next door neighbor. It could right. be a another person who lives in another state, but just happens to be at that, um, at oh, that yeah. conference or expo or whatever you're at and you make that connection and right. that's lifelong. Yeah. One of the things that, uh, actually I learned, we learned it from, uh, Brandon Eddy, Brandon yeah. and Stacy, Stacy, Stephanie. Uh, Stephanie Eddy, sorry, Steph, um, that, um, make friends. Yes. You make if, lots especially of friends. if you're somebody who's got a YouTube channel, because yep. that's one of the ways that you grow it is you, you, you develop a friendship Yes, right. and there is such a wide a range of knowledge in the crowd. It is so amazing. Yes. Uh, you know, just by doing the series that we're doing and being part of the Farm to Table Direct Show, we have come across so many people that, yep. you know, especially talking to them like we're talking to you tonight, mm -hmm. that uh, that has a specialized knowledge. And if it wouldn't have been for that, oh, you know. No way uh, to tap in. Right. That. right. And, and I'll tell you this. If ever I, I do a rain catchment system in the future, <laughs> and we're planning to, right? Yes, we talked about that. Yeah, we yeah. talked about it. And... Uh, I'll be I'll be reaching out to one of my friends. That's right. Exactly. You know, to say, hey, you know, we're kind of stuck here. What's yeah. up? You know, well, experience is the uh, best teacher. Sure. And we have the experience and we want to share that. You know, that's something I've seen across the board in the homesteading community and at these events, the expos and stuff like that, is not just that the knowledge is there, but the willingness to share that well, knowledge. Well, yeah, because it somebody else sharing their knowledge made our journey easier. So if I can share my knowledge and make your journey easier. Why would I not do that? Right. You know, I think it's that selflessness that, that is there. I mean, there's um, something we've, you know, over and over again, we've had conversation with people that it's, that it's not competition. No, you know, it, it's, it, it's, right. it's community and it is trying to help. Right. And, um, you know, and it's like any community, there's people that aren't going to click with each other. Right. I mean, they don't respect each other. Right. They just, they just yeah, don't click. They don't click. Yeah. And, and you know, Chris, the Oklahoma Homestead Rendezvous is a community is what it's all about. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's true. You know, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I have great neighbors, um, but they're not doing the same thing I'm doing. Right. But if I wanted to know, learn something that I know they're doing, you bet I'm going to go knock on the door. And right. YouTube and the, and, the, and the rendezvous and things like that, that's exactly the same thing. You, mm -hmm. you have the opportunity. And... You know, we went to, like I said earlier, we went to uh, Doug and Stacey's, one of their homestead sure. events, and a gentleman sat down across from us, and we got to talking to him. Now, we're in Missouri. He right. lives in um, in uh, northern Oklahoma, and we met him and had a great conversation. He's also one of the presenters we were talking earlier okay. about. Oh, okay. So, yeah. you know, you don't know who you're going to meet. You could actually literally meet a neighbor <laughs> right. or yes. somebody who, who you're going to actually be coming across on a regular basis. And it's yeah. just nice to have that community because we cannot do it all on our own. No. You cannot do this on your own. And and you can't know everything you need to know to do this on your own. You have to have that support and that community to say, you know, hey, how did you do this? Oh, well, this is our experience. These are the things we learned. And right. so maybe if I save somebody else right. from having an issue somewhere down the road and save them time and money and energy and frustration, 
it's worth it. Well, you know what I've learned? Hmm. I got a whole lot of roofing. Has ever been in my roofing and shingles? Shingles. <laughs> yeah, you got a lot of roofing to do. <laughs> you, got lot, you got a lot of roofing to do. Yes, uh, you do. No, it, it, that, it's been great. And, and, and it's that knowledge and it's that community, you know, and it's that it's ability community. to share. And we appreciate you very much again oh, coming my down. And, my pleasure. And, and it was, you know, I was just talking with Chris earlier. That was a great conversation. We were talking airplanes and uh, stuff. Airplane. So, yeah. uh, That's you know, thing. but um, anyway, um, bro, I guess, you know, if, unless there's something else, I guess we can bring this on in for a landing or you want to. No, we're talking airplanes again. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. Well, you flew in them for a couple of years, you know. So. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, you know, I just want to encourage everybody out there to come out and, um, and, and see what we're talking about. Because oh, yeah. if you have not done this, mm-hmm. I guarantee you, you have no idea what you're in for. Oh, man. The sheer pleasure. I mean, when we left there, I mean, yeah, as my brother said, I was exhausted from my nose to my toes. Absolutely. But it was so much fun. And we were on such a high after, oh, yeah. after the whole thing, you know. You know and, and we're looking forward to the next one. I mean, it's just like when you're done with one, you're starting yes. to prepare for, you know, what's coming next. You yes. know, because, you want to go to the next one and the next right. one and the next one. You know, and this was, I mean, even this, I mean, of course, with working towards, uh, you know, with Oklahoma Homestead Rendezvous, but it was this this mindset that we kind of set in with us when we were at Oki back in, in March was, you know, expo year round, <laughs> because we get to talk to these y'all guys year round. Right. So for us, it's that way. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm usually the one doing the walking around out there, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's the way it's worked out. Um, and yeah. People say, you know, though, who was you? Ah, I gotta go back and watch because there were so many people, mm-hmm. and it's like when you've got a hundred plus vendors, you've got three or four thousand people attending. But you know, we went from June in twenty three, which is the first one we went to because it was in June that year. Nine months later, we come back to that second one, and it was more like a reunion than mm-hmm. it was new oh, yes. people on a block. It was like, hey, hey, you know, all these people you. Uh, you talked about um, Linda. Uh, uh, we are, yeah. See you, Jack. See you, and Jack said, "See you at the rendezvous." Jack, all right, and, Jack and Dina did. They said, <laughs> they, um, "And uh, but anyway, um, there was somebody." Yeah. What are the dates again for the rendezvous? Um, well, that is September twenty seventh and twenty eighth. Mm-hmm. Um, I will be going over that just a little bit more here in just a minute uh, when we wrap up. I'll give you the details on that um, on that particular thing there, Linda. Um, right. And, and I want to say something else, too, mm-hmm. about the rendezvous. You know, we're still looking for sponsors and we're still looking for uh, people to volunteer. We yeah, need heavy, volunteers. Heavy I know on the volunteers. We'll be there. We're going to be doing our part. And uh, if you've got a homestead channel, I can tell you there's no better way to make friends than be a volunteer. Guaranteed. You will meet everybody. <laughs> um, and, and it is. It's, you know, I mean, it, it takes an army. A uh, small army to put one of these things on, yes. um, and you know, from and, and the, the simplest of tasks matter to to be able to pull these things off. And uh, uh, Chris and Dodge them have taken on a mm-hmm. uh, a huge undertaking, you know, monumental uh, role. Um, and yeah. fortunately, there's there's been some good people who jump on board with them to help out. Yep. And uh, but uh, it is definitely an, an overwhelming task when you start trying to put this this size of something. Uh, together together and so, yep. and so hats it's a off. lot of work a lot of work and chris and and, and her team have been so tireless who, would, with who would they reach out to if they want to volunteer or sponsor well, or, or even um, to be a vendor <laughs> <laughs> i was going to get to it in a little while but we'll get to it now okay, uh, jumping, that's uh, okay that's okay no i can do it it's oklahoma homestead rendezvous you can find them on facebook um it's also oklahoma homestead rendezvous.com make sure i get that right because i've got it written down over here um yep da, 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 da. i'm gonna make sure yep Nope, that wasn't the dot com. That was a different one. Either way, you can find them on Facebook, Oklahoma Homestead Rendezvous. Um, she also has an email, which is okhomesteadrendezvous at gmail.com. Nope. No, it's not Chris. Give it to me. I know you're listening. Is uh, Yahoo. Yahoo. Yahoo.com. Yeah. Yeah. They're on Yahoo. Right. I keep forgetting. Uh, everybody else is on Gmail. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and if you forget that, just look over in the uh, live chat section. Yeah. You'll see Oklahoma yeah. Homestead okay. Rendezvous there. Yep. There it is. Website yeah. will be up soon, she says. Oh, okay. So there will be a website coming soon. Gotcha. Um, so you can reach out to Chris. Yeah, Yahoo. Yahoo. Thank, <laughs> uh, you, Chris. thank you, Chris. Um, you can reach out to Chris, like I said, you know, on the Facebook chat. Um, reach out to that email. And, you know, I know she'll be glad to sit there and give you the information on that. Uh, there's some stuff that can be sent out to you if you're interested in sponsoring, if you're interested in a vendor, speaker, right. um, whatever the case is. I know she told us the other day that uh, we're going to start working on the schedule in July. So getting all that lined out, mm-hmm. but uh, you can reach out to her. Listen, it'll be a great time. This is 
from everything I've understood and everything I've read and in talking with Chris and them and in talking with other people, this is going to be a little bit different than what most people are because there's going to be a farmer's market going on during this time. There's going to be cool. animal uh, people can bring their animals in and, and trade and sell while they're there. There's going to be the regular vendors. There's going to be food trucks that are going to be there. Live music is going to be there, um, as well as the speaker presenters and stuff like that going on. Uh, it is going to be uh, really just an all-around uh, event, and I will promise you, you cannot find a place cheaper to go. Uh, you can't get okay. cheaper tickets right. than what this is. You can't get into this, even as a vendor, cheaper than what you can here. And, and I say cheap, I mean just low cost. Uh, right. right. You know, because it's that was one of the, the big things was to be able to make it affordable for anybody to come and be open to it. And I get that. And as, I, as I've told before on the show, as I've priced around the country, I know what the prices are to get into <laughs> some of these places right. uh, as either just an attendee or as a vendor. And, uh, you know, so it is definitely that it's the first one, as far as I know, in this part of Oklahoma um, and in the southeast corner. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a great thing. It's going to be in the city of McAllister at the Southeast Expo Center. Um, mm-hmm. So there is hotels available there in McAllister. I know the city of McAllister is on board with her behind this. We've um, they've been helping to promote it and that type of thing. So mm-hmm. it is a uh, it's a happening thing. And uh, I've been to the Southeast Expo Center before. It is huge. There was a monumental amount of space out there. Good. Um, yeah. There is actually some limited, but there are some uh, camper hookups out there for people who may need them, but they're limited. There's only a few spots. Um, and I know that I think they said that there's going to be some discount. There may be some discounts or something from some of the hotels in the area for those that are coming. So that's maybe. Good. That's where I'll probably be. That's, <laughs> that's where we'll be. Uh, we're getting with hotels for discounts. She just said, yeah. yeah. Okay. Verified. Right. As I said, we have stuff in private chat that goes on, and sometimes I try to remember it. And, um, but anyway, um, so that's that. And I will, you well, know. Bro, just, just a little bit uh-huh. before we wrap sign this off up. here. Yep. Mm-hmm. What do we got coming up next week? Well, listen, man. Um, next week on July second at seven p.m., we are going to be having Stuart and Ashley Klaus from Restoration Farm coming two, back two point oh. Yeah, two point <laughs> oh. That's, That's right. right. We're bringing them back. Uh, do some issues with technology on our last uh, live with them. Um, audio was terrible. Just be honest with you, audio was terrible, and we had to pull uh, it down. We felt that we just we had to take it off, and we felt we owed it to them. We owed it to you and to ourselves. Um, to have them come back on and talk about their topic of homesteading. Uh, what they shared was great. It was just very difficult to um, to understand it and right. follow it. And so to be fair to them, to be fair to the topic, and right. to, to our listeners even, uh, to right. people who want to learn, uh, because I'll promise you they dropped out a whole bunch of right. knowledge. So if you want to see if we can catch lightning in a yeah, bottle twice, <laughs> you'll have to show up. you got to show up next next, next Tuesday. 7 p.m. Right here. Right same, here. Same and, place. Uh, and um, so we're going to be doing that. And um, they're also going to be speaking at the rendezvous on homesteading. Uh, this entire series for the next uh, all the way through September uh, will be people that are going to be speaking at the rendezvous. They That's will, right. Some of them will also be speaking at other places. You um, want to drop a few names? Do you got any? Um, you know, I've got a whole list over here. You know, uh, let me see. Let me find there. Yeah, let me see. Uh, of course, uh, David Thoming from uh, Land and Fi- uh, Arrowhead Land and Finance is coming mm-hmm. in. All right. Um, Dwayne Hall is coming in uh, yep. in July. Amanda Hardcastle from HLC Longhorns. Yep. Um, let's see. Where are we at? Susan Gonzalez from Secret Garden Farms is going to be coming up this uh, in August. Monty Shrunk from Suburban Sodbuster. Some of y'all may know who he is. He's going to be joining. Um, let's see. Morgan Hendricks from Wild Root Country Store. Lauren Denny from Simple Country Ranch. And Holly and David Lacey from Glory Hills Farmstead. That's our list through September. So we've got quite a uh, action-packed uh uh, Our moderator just listen. said, Ryan, speak into the microphone. Okay, man, listen. <laughs> Turn the gain up, okay? <laughs> anyway, um, no, there's going to be – we've got an action pack July, August, into September. It is going to be week after week. There's only, I think, maybe one or two dates. Uh, right, Tuesdays that we won't be the, on. Tuesdays that we won't be on. We're going to be on every Tuesday. And right. then, uh, of course um, – and I'm going to give you the list of uh, things we've got coming up. Not only I just told you the shows we've got coming up, uh, but September 6th and 7th at the Ozark Homestead Expo in uh, Marshfield, Missouri. We will mm-hmm. be there, Webster County Fairgrounds. Uh, you can get tempo, info and tickets at OzarkHomesteading.com. I have been told be sure to book a place early in Springfield. It's the nearest city you can find hotels. Um, but um, I've talked with uh, Cheryl 
up there. Cheryl Jenner, she's the one that puts that on. Mm-hmm. And they are 4,000 plus attendees. They've got, again, well over 100 vendors. they got a lot going on up there. And uh, this is going to be, I think, consecutive year number five. They started in 2019. And uh, it is one of, by, by accounts, one of the top in the country. Um, mm-hmm. yes. Yep. Yes. And so, uh, you know, we will, we are certainly excited to, to be allowed to be a part of that and to have been, you know, asked to come up. And um, so we're looking forward to that. That'll be September 6th and 7th. Of course, our Urban Homestead Expo in OKC mm-hmm. at the yeah. uh, State Fair, Oklahoma State Fair on September 15th. Um, entry is included with the price of admission to the fair. So you can get to come have the fair. The kids can run around. You can get your state fair corn dog. You can go hang out with some of us homestead people. And, yeah. You know, and besides, uh, you know, we'll be there just hanging out. We're, we're actually not working. Yeah, that we're way, not so working. We'll we're not be free to talk. We're just there to hang out. Uh, we will be in Support. the Farm to Table Direct Show t-shirts. Yeah. Um, so if you see us, you know, come up and say hi. Um, that's being hosted by our friends at Hidden Heights Farm and Keeping It Dutch, who are also behind Okie Homestead Expo. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, they were asked to do that, and they've put that together, a very uh, specialized set of uh, uh, speakers focusing solely on urban homesteading. Yes. Um, so doing yep. things that you can do in your backyard, in town, doesn't matter where you live kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a lot of knowledge there to absorb. I've, I've seen the list of speakers. I don't have it in front of me because I don't have my computer like I normally do. <laughs> uh, but it is a, it's, it's definitely worth the drive. Like I said, got the fair to go with it. So, right. I mean, it's, right. it's a blast. And, of course, September 27th, 28th, Oklahoma Homestead Rendezvous, McAllister, Oklahoma, Southeast Expo. Uh, we're a sponsor of this event. I'm also going to be speaking. And you can get more info on their Facebook page, as we said earlier, Oklahoma Homestead Rendezvous. And we'll be doing uh, live interviews. There. We will be live there. We'll be setting up interviews, yeah. much like we did at Oki Expo. Um, we'll be doing some run and gun, going around talking yep. to people, and uh, just all of everything homesteading that weekend. Um, yes, sir. So uh, Chris chimed in, 33 hookups for the RVs. Oh, that's and a So quite a bit more than I was thinking. And it's an 80,000-square-foot expo building. Wow. So uh, huge. Plenty of room. Plenty of room to <laughs> spread out. Plenty yeah. of room. And so uh, weather, uh, that, that's the beauty of that is if the weather happens to be uh, <laughs> shaky, we can, as it is, can be in late September in Oklahoma, yeah. uh, we have the option of indoors. But it's... Um, yeah, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a great event down there. So as you can see, yeah. uh, the Farm to Table Direct Show is going to be very busy for the next few months, <laughs> uh, bringing y'all lots of great content mm-hmm. and uh, you know giving y'all a chance like this to to sit with somebody that's a speaker, that's an expert, to, that's learned, that's growing through all of this <laughs> as a fellow homesteader. Um, and Lorraine, where can they find you? Uh, Bluff Creek Acres okay. uh, is our YouTube channel, mm-hmm. and. Um, I am on Instagram as well. This okay. Bluff Creek Acres. Bluff Creek Acres. No Facebook page? No. Not yet. Not I haven't yet. gotten that far. Yeah, okay. <laughs> took, 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 took us a little while Maybe. to warm over there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Eventually, but yeah. not yet. Okay. So Instagram and YouTube. Yes. Bluff Creek Acres. Acres. All yes. right. And that's Lorraine Sheehock. Yes. Cheehock. 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 Like Chia. Chia. Yeah, bro, I told you to practice that. <laughs> Listen, man, we have said that to each other probably a hundred times. This On week. purpose. On purpose. <laughs> Without even needing to, just so that we knew. Try how to, to get that right. Chia. Yeah, it's a hard one because it's not spelled like you pronounce it. Right. right. And it's and it's not Indian. It's not Indian. No, it's Czechoslovakian. Yeah, oh, I was surprised because I thought, oh, this must be Indian. Yep, yeah, my right. husband is full blooded Czechoslovakian. All yeah. right. All right. So, yeah. Well, I yeah. didn't quite make it to the Czech Republic. And okay. and the Czechs grow amazing beards, I can tell you that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Chris has got an amazing uh, one. He, he does have a nice one, yes. Yeah. But, yep. uh, All right. Anyway, Let's get this thing wrapped all up, All right. Bro. Well, listen, man. You know, hey, listen, folks, listen. Again, thank you for tuning us in. Uh, it's a great episode, our great conversation with Lorraine. Thank you. And, uh, man, we're just I'm looking forward to hearing more. I'm looking forward to learning more. And it's uh, uh, my wife was looking for your channel last night. She's <laughs> she's interested in the rainwater thing. And there's uh, a few videos about it on there. <laughs> okay, so she's, she's interested. But, uh Anyway, we've talked about the events. We've talked about who we've got coming up. Uh, Kyle said that's debatable. <laughs> he must be talking about the beard. <laughs> yes, he is. <laughs> well, my wife hates mine too, so it's <laughs> it's kind of a thing in our family. All the boys have beards. beards. Yeah. So I, I have a cousin it. who said one time. If you want to find them, just look for the Duck Dynasty guys because <laughs> they all <laughs> well, have the that's big, a good fuzzy my, beard. I, I, I remember watching that show, and I asked my wife if I could have, you know, if I could, if she cared if I grew a beard that big, and she said, "When you got their money, you can have that beard." Uh, <laughs> so you, you see by this little beard how much money I got, how close I've gotten. <laughs> yes. But uh, 
anyway, but listen, right. hey, this has been great. This has been a lot of fun, folks. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you found it enlightening. Um, again, hit the like, hit the bell, hit subscribe, share. Let folks know we're out there. That's how we get out there. It's word of mouth. It's not right. anything else we do. It's just it's y'all supporting us and we supporting you. We're um, stronger together. That's guys. it. We are stronger exactly. together. Um, if we're on Facebook. We're on YouTube. Hashtag, Hashtag stronger together. Yeah. Um, we are on Facebook and YouTube. The Farm, the number two table direct show. That is the Farm, the number two table direct show. Uh, got it right that time. I didn't. But anyway, <laughs> um, and so listen. As we always say here on the Farm to Table Direct Show, as we head out the door, remember, we are stronger together. And as always, prepare for the unexpected and keep it local.